Hello, this is Melissa Hale Spencer, the editor of the Altamont Enterprise, here today with Mary Jo Batter, who is a volunteer community caregiver par excellence. Welcome, Mary Jo. Thank you. We heard about you from one of your clients, Kathy Gordon, who said you're the nicest person she knows. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd like to just start by hearing a little about yourself and how it is you became a caregiver. Okay. Well, um, in 2013 um, is when I first volunteered. Prior to that, I had been for six years um, a full-time caregiver for my mother in her apartment here in Gilderland. My mother uh, had dementia and could not live alone. So from 2000, in 2007, I took an early retirement and came to live with my, my mom and took care of her for six years. So uh, in 2013, it became necessary to place her in a <clears throat> nursing home. So after I put her in the nursing home, then I had all this time on my hands because prior to that, I had been just uh, kind of cloistered in this apartment. Um, And so all of a sudden I had this freedom to now go out and be out and about. But then I said, well, okay, now what do I do? Um, Because I had been, you know, inside for like six years. So I had always read the caregiver's column in the enterprise. And I, I had been saying to myself, you know, I think I could do that. That sounds like a nice opportunity to help people. So that's what I did. I called, I just called the number and um, <clears throat> they just, you know, asked me to come in to the office. And so it, that's when it started. You just, I just went in and I talked to the volunteer coordinator um, and that's basically when I started. That's how I started. It just, it was just something to get me to find s- some way to get me out and about and back in the world again, because I had been really not, not a part of the world for six years. Yeah. Before we go on and hear about your volunteer work, I'd love to hear more about taking care of your mother and what that was like, because really so few people do do that these days, I think. Um, tell me just a little uh, about your mother. Uh, well, my mother, we, we grew up here in, uh, we grew up in Gilderland Center. And then my mother uh, moved to an apartment at Heritage Village. And um, what it was, well, when I first, it just became apparent to us, my brothers and sisters, that my our mom can't live alone. She just, you know, she couldn't drive. She couldn't um, deal with food preparation and things like that. So, so living with her and taking care of her was just like a wonderful opportunity for me as a daughter to just take care of my mother. And it, but what um, were your other siblings supportive? Yes, or, they. Yeah. But they were all mostly away or my sister lived in Schenectady but she was still working full time so and what has been your career what did you do um I worked um as a well my degree is in accounting I was just mainly like administrative type jobs Mm -hmm. but away from this area I spent my working life in Florida and Georgia oh (laughs) long story I won't explain but (laughs) But um, then I came but I came back (laughs) I, can't, I always had roots here in mm-hmm. Gilderland. So I said, okay, I'm going to take my little severance package. I'm going to <clears throat> go and take care of mom. So it was mainly, it's an evolving process when you take care of a parent, when you take care of someone with dementia. <clears throat> the level of her dementia at the beginning was not severe. She was able to understand and just deal. She still read the paper. She still did the you know, crossword puzzles. She still had neighbors come in. We took to, we would take her to the doctor, walk in, she could walk into the doctor's office, but it evolves. It, um, it just, by 2013, 
we no longer could have the television on because she didn't understand that the television was, she thought the television was like real in her home. It made her very nervous. She she thought there were real people coming into her right. living room. So yeah. you just, as as you take care of someone with dementia, you understand, oh, this 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 is a situation that causes them stress, so we have to avoid that. And then you just learned through, you have to be resourceful, and you just learn when I would put her to bed at night. She, my mother was a nurse all her life. She had this mental image that she was taking care of a group of people, and they were on this journey. And she could not rest until all her people that she was taking care of were, that they were taken care of. She was fretful that, oh, you know, what's going to happen to all these people who I'm taking care of? So her so, role as a caregiver herself was so central to her that even with dementia, she had the sense that she had a care for other people to exactly, rest. Exactly, exactly. And this actually, I have this theory that pe- even people with dementia, even in their deepest dementia, do not lose this core this core person that they really are because my mother, even at the nursing home, even when she was weeks away from dying and deeply into her dementia, she still would, I would walk into the nursing home, I went every day, she would be reaching out to the lady next to her and saying, oh, are you warm enough? Can I help you? That she never lost that. So, Oh, um, isn't that mm, interesting? It's very interesting. It must be hard because when you're a child, your mother is in charge of you. What was it like to have to have those roles reversed? Yeah. I would think that would be very um, difficult. Right. It's not, it's just, uh, it's just something you just, okay, here's what it is and let's deal with it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I always felt this, my family situation was a little different in that my father was elderly. My father was in his late 50s when I was born. So I grew up in a family with a more or less elderly parent. And my brothers and my sister and I all agree that we felt growing up that we had to more or less um, take care of and look after our dad instead of the other you know, way instead around. Of the other way around. We, were always, yeah. we would never try to... Um, do something to upset him. So then, so when I stepped into the role of caring for my mother, it was not a total, oh gosh, you know, it wasn't really um, a a hard thing to accommodate. I just, and it also, when you're doing it day by day, day by day, day by day, it's, it just, the changes occur that you don't even realize, oh, but you have to change, you know, you change your um, daily routine or behavior depending upon what is necessary to take care of this person, the person that she is right now today. And, okay, you know, what is it that she can handle and what does not she not understand? And so how do I need to change <clears throat> our daily routine <clears throat> in order to... Um, get through this day. Let's get through this day. And I think many caregivers would agree with me when you say, okay, let's just get through this day. Let's get through this moment. Um, It's just like a coping mechanism, a way of saying, um, okay, here's the situation and I I can't walk away from it. We have to, you know, make the best of it. My mother needs this, this, and this. So let's just say, how do we, how to, how do we accomplish these tasks and provide these for these needs? For so, yeah. as you're doing this over the course of six years, when do you know when you get to the point that she needs a nursing home? How yeah. how do you decide? Because right. each day must be yeah. a tremendous challenge. And <laughs> that is a good question. And um, looking back. I say to myself, where did those six years go? You know, because they're, to me, they're like the missing years. But what happened in my, in our situation was my mother fell twice 
and broke her arm twice. Even though I was right next to her, sometimes you just can't prevent someone from falling. So I and you're just a very knew. slight person. Just people who haven't seen you, you're a petite, <laughs> very slight person. So, yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. So this, I knew it was getting worse. I knew that the time to put her in a nursing home was coming. And I actually, we had been, ta- I had been talking to my family. We had been making preparations for, okay, the time is going to come. And then when she fell, broke her arm for the second time, and we were in the emergency room at Ellis, I just said, okay, we cannot bring mom back to the apartment. We have to find a bed in a nursing home. And luckily, we were so fortunate. We found a bed at Daughters of Sarah, a lovely nursing home. That is a lovely nursing home. The relief... Really and truly, the relief that I felt that day when the social worker come in and said, she came in and said, we have a bed for your mother at Daughters of Sarah. I was like, oh. It, then I just You knew could, it was right. Yes. You know when it's time. Yeah. yeah. But then I, that's, so then when she went in, that was 2013, then I would wake up in the morning and say, well, now what do I do? Because now I'm in the apartment, like, alone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So um, so I would go to visit her every day. And then, but I knew that myself, my, my sense of self and my sense of being in this world were distorted. Like it, I had fear. I was, I had um, fear of like driving and going out, going anywhere other than, say, Price Chop or, mm-hmm. or you know, mm-hmm. the gross, the drugstore. So I, I had, one day I had to go to a doctor on Manning Boulevard. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, Manning Boulevard. It was like you might as well have told me I had to drive to, you know, Australia or something. <laughs> and I got, I said, I got, I got past Fuller Road. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I don't even know, you know, like where I am. So... I did. I got through that, and I said to myself, "I have to get out and drive. I have to make myself just be in the world again." And I, in the back of my head, I had, you know, I had known about community caregivers, and I thought I could do that. Um, I could picture myself, you know, just driving people and helping people. So that's when I called, and. Um, went in and um they're so lovely there it's right it's right in Gildon. people may not know it's so close it's right on the corner of route 20 and 155 like right where near the, where the right aid used to be so you just go there and you um talk to the coordinator and then you go through an orientation um they do they do they check your driving record and they check your and they do a background check naturally and then they explain to you you know what's expected of a volunteer and um what's expected of the client who you're driving there are you know they have to be able to um physically walk for, like from their home maybe with a walker but or a cane, but they have to be able to get themselves from their home into your car um, with minimal assistance. And so, but uh, C- Community Caregivers has uh, an RN who assesses the potential clients. When, if, you're, if you think you need help and you call Community Caregivers, then they will send um, a nurse to your home to just interview you and assess your needs and your ability to get into someone's car because caregivers yeah. doesn't provide medical help it provides all other kinds of right. assistance right um we <clears throat> can we can provide a um like to support like and this is just natural for me i always touch people i just you hold their elbow or you you know hold onto their arm as they're getting in the car mm-hmm. um but but we're not um like you said, we don't provide medical assistance. So then, so the client has now been approved, and they're going to be a client, and you're you're going to be a one of the volunteers. So what happens? This is what people may find interesting. I I think it's a miracle, really. On Monday, on Mondays and Tuesdays, 
caregivers has uh, one or two associates who call. They call. Well, they've they've been receiving calls from the clients because as a client, you call caregivers when you have a doctor's appointment or any appointment that you need to get to. So you call them, and they keep a record of everyone who needs rides and where they need to go. So on Monday morning, there are two, one or two uh, people who these are the true workhorses. They call all the volunteers, and they know where the volunteer lives and where the client lives and needs to go. So they coordinate, they'll call you, and for myself, usually they would leave a voicemail, and they would say, we have a lady in Gilderland who needs to go to a doctor in Albany on, you know, they give you the date and time. Or we have a gentleman on Carmen Road who needs to go to Sunnyview in Schenectady, you know, and they'll just give you a general idea of what they need. And this is for the following week. They're always... They they work well ahead, and so they are scheduling the next week's appointments. So then you, as a volunteer uh, driver, would say, "Oh yes, I'm I'm free." They also know you tell them when your days, your availability. Mm-hmm. So um, for myself, let's say I was usually just available on Mondays and Tuesdays. So that's they knew only to call me for those appointments. So then I would call back. Yes, this is Mary Jo. Yes, I can drive the gentleman to you know his appointment, whatever. So then they send you an email. It, probably if you have email. If you don't, they probably just call you and give you the information. They give you the detailed information of the person's name, address, where they're going. And then you confirm back, yes, got it. Yes, I will drive this person. And then you call the client, you, the volunteer, call the person you're going to drive. If it's a new person that you haven't driven, then, well, for myself, I would introduce myself and say who I am. I'm a volunteer with community caregivers, and I'm going to drive you to your appointment next Wednesday. And then they're always, oh, okay. You know, they're always <laughs> very lovely. Uh, and then you say, okay, I'm going to pick you up at such and such time. And you say, okay, do you have a front door, a side door? You know, where am I going to come? And so then um, then I would always give them a quick call the day of saying, okay, it's me again. I'm going to be there like just in an to hour. Remind them. Mm-hmm. And just so people know, the caregiver started in Altamont, but it has expanded, and it's well beyond Gilderland now. It also serves New Scotland, Burn and Knox, and I think parts of Albany. Albany, right? yes. So yes. Um, what interested me as you were talking is this idea that it helped you yourself in some way, that as a volunteer, I mean, you're certainly obviously helping the people that would not be able to live in their own homes if they didn't have that outside help. But could you just talk, and I'm sure you probably can't mention particular clients' names, but maybe just experiences you've had that have felt good to you with people you've gotten to know through doing this. Yes, that's. I agree that uh, not only myself, but I think most volunteers would probably say that you, the volunteer, probably gets more out of it than the person you're driving. Uh, For myself, it did, it just allowed me to, you know, be a new person and just increase my confidence, my ability to just (laughs) get through day to day. Um, I have had many um, wonderful clients. I should back up a minute and say, um, most of the services are driving. But community caregivers also does what they call respite care, and that is where I have had the greatest um, fulfillment, sort of personal experience. In respite care, what you're doing is there will be there's generally, um, in my experience, a, a couple, a husband and a wife, one or the other is. Um, <clears throat> needs to be taken care of so the caregiver themselves need to be able to get out of the house and 
And just you do. personally can certainly understand that. Exactly. Having been, exactly. as you said, cloistered with exactly. your mother. Exactly, yes. So, so in respite care, that community caregivers contacted me and they, you know, they'll say, we have this situation, we have this couple, and this is the situation, and the, you know, they need assistance one or two days, you know, a week. Do you think you could do that? Yes. So in that situation, you are really entering their lives more than just getting in a car and driving someone. Um, I had uh, just briefly, I had a wonderful um, w woman in Albany. She was a retired nurse, an operating room nurse at Albany Med. She herself, this wasn't respite care. This was just like going in and helping her. She needed help doing her laundry because her washer was in the cellar. She could not do the stairs. Mm -hmm. So community caregiver says, we just need someone to go in once a week and do a load of wash for this woman. So I said, oh, yeah, I could do that. So um, I got to know. So, you know, I'm while her laundry is washing, I'm talking to her and hearing all her stories of 40 years in the operating room at Albany Med, which is, you know, very interesting. So then I, and then I had another couple in Gilderland who um, I just would go in in the afternoon so the gentleman could go and go to the Y and swim. He just wanted to get out of his, get out of the house, go do a little grocery shopping and go swimming at the Y. So that, and that helped him a lot. And my most current situation is, and I have been in this assignment now for almost two years, it's a respite care situation for a couple in Gilderland and the wife has early onset Alzheimer's. And she's in her 50s. Oh. And she's a vibrant, intelligent, lovely person. And um, she's just, you know, is just so sad that she now has this Alzheimer's. But she's very, she, she is able to go out and do lots of things. And this is what's so frustrating for herself, you know, to deal with this situation. So... I started by just going there on Tuesdays. That was the agreed upon day. I would go on Tuesdays. We would just hang out, go, go to the mall, maybe go to the movies, and go to visit her friends. And this is where, and she has this wonderful network of interesting, wonderful friends. And this is where I met um, Kathy, the other. And so for me, myself now, I, now, I have benefited by being introduced to all of her friends, and I, and I don't even consider her a client anymore. She's my friend, really. And we go, I take her to concerts at the library and concerts at the university, and we go to the movies. And um, so I really now feel like a part of that family, you know. Um, so it's very true to say that what I have gotten out of caregivers is much more than any of my clients have. Um, and another way I look at it is I say to myself, with all the, this, with all the, with all the anger that's in the world right now, this is my way of kind of climbing out and doing one tangible thing for for a person to help like one person or help one family and like i i cannot solve all the issues and problems that are going on but i can do one thing one tangible thing to be of help to one person you know, oh, so that's, that's just a wonderful philosophy. I love it because none of us can solve everything, but if each of us does something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I wonder, you touched on something in that last description, which was just so moving, that you've become a real friend and it's enriched your life. But how do you have any coping mechanisms you can share? Because this vibrant, intelligent woman, 
you know from your mother's dementia what the end point is with Alzheimer's. How do you deal with that when you've become a friend and invested so much of mm. yourself? It it must be almost like a mourning process you go through. Well, um, I guess my my coping mechanism is, again, to just treat each day, okay, I always say at the beginning of every day, I say thank you for this day and all things in it, you know, and I just look at this day and this is where we are today and aren't we lucky, you know, that we can be out and about and we can enjoy this, we can enjoy each other, we can go visit friends and have this marvelous, you know, friendship and fun and camaraderie and and thank you for this day. And I don't, I, I really, I guess, don't dwell on what's going to happen tomorrow because I don't really know. That's um, great. Carpe diem. Yeah. <laughs> Seize the day. Well, yeah. I did want to just share with people some numbers because the caregivers I had thought of as um, continuing in perpetuity, growing, blossoming. It's been here for 25 years. We've written scores and scores of articles and columns on it. But when I was writing recently for its 25th anniversary, I was caught up short when I saw the numbers, which um, Joel Edwards, one of the original founders, had shared. Um, he gave a speech at the 25th anniversary gala in which he gave these numbers. The caregivers had 170 volunteers in 2010, and that number fell to 131 in 2016 and to 92 in 2019. So this may be why Mary Jo is doing the work of probably five or ten volunteers, it sounds like. But um, that's nearly cut in half in the last decade. And he actually also said that um, more than 40% of the current volunteers are 70 or older. So this makes sense in a way because, as they say, you know, 70 is the new 60 or 50, and people have time when they retire, but really it needs some young blood too. And he had said in that speech, if there's to be a 50-year anniversary celebration, we must solve this problem. So I don't know if you have any kind of closing thoughts, because our time is always <laughs> has sped by, but um, just any closing thoughts for people that might be listening and thinking of becoming a volunteer or, um, you know, is it something that mm -hmm. they could just try and if it didn't work, it would yes. be no loss to anyone? Or what I would, what I would, um, to say in closing is a sort of philosophy that I have learned. If you are thinking about it and you think, gee, you know, maybe I could do that. Maybe, maybe I could. Give yourself permission to try. I love this concept of just giving yourself permission um, to try something. You might be good at it. You might, you might love it, but you might not. So, but that's okay. Just give yourself permission to try it. And that's just great advice for anything in yeah. life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I went, I, just in closing, I had I, the best piece of advice I ever heard from a speaker was a gentleman who said, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. <laughs> and the thing about that is... Because that's the opposite of what people usually right. say. Because you might not be good at it. You won't be good at it at first. Yeah. You know, you weren't good at walking when you first tried. But Oh, I if, love it. Yeah. So give it a go. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Mary okay. Jo Batter. You're Inspirational. Welcome. Okay.